So um, with that, I want to transition to today's uh, seminar, which is a very different format. Today, instead of having one speaker speaking on one issue, we actually have a panel of Humphrey Fellows. I happen to be the director of the Humphrey program at Cornell, but these are mid-career professionals who are coming from um, around the world and with very, very interesting perspectives to share. It's going to be moderated by one of the fellows, and I'm just going to have my job here just to introduce the moderator, Edith Mugeu from Zimbabwe, who is going to be moderating the session for us. Thank you, Ed. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so today, our session is going to be focusing on the conflict that is quite common, contrary to what we might assume, the conflict between economic development and environmental protection. In most instances, it's so easy to assume that it's either I'm for environmental protection or I'm for economic efficiency, but there are times when one has to make some trade-offs, one has to sacrifice one for the other, and um, today in this session, I am so excited to hear uh, from these diverse Humphrey Fellows based on their uh, professional and personal experiences in their home countries. So to begin the session, I'm going to ask each and every one of you guys to introduce yourself uh, in just two minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Edith. Um, my name is Afama Yusuf Makar. I come from Tanzania and I do programs in the sending up uh, in Tanzania. As the organization, uh, mission is to restore a unique water corridor that is located in the east part of, 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 of the country. And my goal for today basically will be to shed a light on how conservation is being impacted by uh, economic growth and the consequences that it, it, it provides for, for all species, particularly for and other, other species. Hello, my name is Najira Kurban Baiba. I am from Uzbekistan. In Uzbekistan, I'm also a researcher at the Center for Economic Research and Reform. And there and here at Cornell, my specialization is agricultural economics, uh, systems, and economic security. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Hello, everyone. I'm Jamari Iskimara from Burundi. And in Burundi, I'm the CEO of Geneco Company, which is a plant recycle company. I also lead in part you know, domain of protection and climate change resilience within a local NGO in Burundi, focusing on planting trees, water and sanitation, and everything around you know, climate change. And I'm very happy to be here. Good afternoon. My name is Dong Pei Hong from South Korea. I've been working in ship over 13 years because I love the sea, ocean. Um, back in 2010, I started my career in container ships to load and discharge tons of thousands of containers over the world. And in 2010, 2017, I took I some postcard to inspect emissions and expand oil pollution. However, I would like to commit myself to solve the root of problem, which is energy, oil. So I came to Cornell, Cornell Humphrey Fellowship to study energy policy to change ship energy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this sounds like a very interesting uh, mix. And um, Uh, so I'm wondering if maybe members of the panel you can share with the audience how in your experiences and liberating from your professional experiences, how a situation of potential conflict or tension is presented itself in terms of economic development and environmental protection. Uh, maybe some of you can 
Yeah, sure, Edith. Uh, so for conservation, uh, this is a, this is a common uh, eventuality in conservation. So one of the one of the biggest issues that we are facing in Tanzania is the issue of deforestation. And uh, according to the Global Forest Watch, it is estimated that uh, uh, the deforestation rate could or the forest cover loss is about four hundred thousand hectares on an annual on an annual basis. So what does this mean? And uh, the survey also uh, further concludes that uh, some of the drivers that lead to the loss of forest cover include agriculture and uh, in the development and other many in many other aspects. So uh, and and I come from a region where the, the, it has the highest level of deforestation in, in that in the, in the in the country. So this so the loss of forest cover. What it means actually is is depleting or, or degradation of the natural environment. So you'll have uh, uh, areas where natural or migratory routes like wildlife corridors, because they are within the locality of communities. You have a situation now because of agriculture, uh, shifting, shifting agriculture and unsustainable practice, they deplete this, uh, this environment. Then that, what that lead is that the natural process that we are continuing, such as the elephant migration, because uh, the ecosystem is too much depleted, there is scarcity of resources. Then uh, elephants, as we know, and for those who understand uh, savanna elephants, they have to feed up to 14 hours on a, on, a day, on a daily basis. So how do they get their resources? So eventually they are going to find alternative and while they are going through their migratory behaviors, they meet uh, farms, uh, cultivation areas. And uh, if, you, if, you, if, if we, we made a, an estimation that uh, a big fully fledged a, a bull or male ele elephant, in just 30 minutes, it could consume up to one acres of, of pineapple. And that in a pineapple would take up to one year to grow. So in this context, you see that there is a big challenge. Or for example, somebody might have a pineapple uh, a plantation, and you know, a, 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 a one one coconut one 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 coconut tree could take up to fifteen years to grow, and just in ninety minutes, a, a herd of elephants could destroy that life saving. So, uh, so in this context, you, we are seeing that emergency of conflict is uh, more, most likely to incur in this particular area. So I think this is the uh, conflict that emerged in my locality. Uh, Yes, um, I want to highlight first the shipping industry is the most efficient way of delivering goods, like a camera, like a, you know, chair, clothes. All those commodities, uh, most of them, you know, transferred by ships. However, there are a lot of cases that um, um, detrimental impact on environment, such as emission and oil pollution and ballast water. First, when it comes to emission, um, large ship emit greenhouse gas equivalent to 70,000 cars, according to one you know, um, study. We needed to reduce emission from ship because ship is big. Ship is um, like four times as, as, as big as four darker field. So, I mean, a ship engine is very large. And consumption of oil, like average, depend on the size engine, but it costs consume around 40, 50 tons a day. So, and then the ship using the bunk oil, which is very cheap and it's not good quality. So it will impact the people of life near the coastline, harbors. Yes. And secondly, um, there is a oil pollution. Do you mean, I think of the 2010, the water horizon. Um, since oil is consists of a mix of uh, many different compounds, they're kind of harmful material, harmful. It will kill animal, like, you know, um, what, dwelling, dwelling on animal and fishes. Not only animal, but also it impacts um, like uh, fishing and tourist industry, including community. And 
and the, the water, ballast water, this is water when we um, load the water in the inside of tank, because ship needed to be stable. When we, such as um, I take, I load the water from Asia and I, I come to USA port, I needed to load um, container from USA port. I needed to discharge. Those discharge, you know, um, like a leads generate a lot, a lot of it, like a biochemical, like a, um, a bio, bio harm, harmful material to like, this is this kind of a thing will, um, ecological dis disturbance, it will make, so this kind of problem will happen from ships. We need to focus on, but we need to keep global economy growing up and growing up. This is also, I want to say conflict. We all need access to goods and services, and um, the huge need that we do in respect to that. At the same time, it's causing uh, great harm to life, to the ocean, the ecosystem, and everything. And that ecosystem is something that we do not want. So it's really tricky on which one do we choose in this instance. And uh, maybe John Murray, you can give us some insight based on your experience. Yeah, thank you, Edith. From my experience, I started my career related to my background with nonprofit, whereby I was just in charge of the environmental protection part, except with tree planting, hygiene sanitation campaigns, waste management campaigns, but when it came to just starting a company, of course, a company which is going to solve an environmental issue, the problem was how do I get the product I have in my mind from plastic waste? And uh, combining all what I have done with environment protection side, I was excited. By coming to how do I get this product? Because the path to getting that product, to, I, I knew it was going to generate emissions. But I, was, uh, I took a time to sit and think, balancing emissions I'm going to produce, but also the product I want to develop. And then that conflict was very hard for me. By the end, I'm sorry to say this, I decided to say, I'm involvement, I love you, I'm sorry. I need this product to be developed. That's what I did that time. Thank you. There's a business model there, but there it also involves sacrificing the environment in some aspects. So that was a hard choice. But then again, we have the role of the leadership, the local government. What? Role the government play in this end? Where can the government work? Thank you, Edith. So, Uzbekistan, like many other countries, faces the challenge of balancing environmental protection and economic development. And as a rapidly developing country with um, growing population and expanding industries, there is a high strong pressure to prioritize economic growth over economic environmental protection. The country has made significant um, progress in improving its economic performance in recent years, but this uh, has come at a cost for environment. Therefore, any project in Uzbekistan uh, which involves economic development should also consider uh, the potential tension between economic development and environmental protection. One of such projects that would potentially face this tension is mining sector. Uzbekistan has significant deposits of gold and crop and other mineral resources, and government has identified uh, this industry as one of the key industries for economic development. And Uzbekistan's economy is heavily reliable on um, such energy intensive sectors as this one. However, Mining operations can have significant environmental impacts, including 
soil and water pollution, deforestation, and air pollution. Another challenging area is construction development projects, which have played a significant role in Uzbekistan's economy. While these projects have uh, created jobs and increased the country's infrastructure, uh, there is a potential for tension between economic development and environmental protection. Many construction projects, they uh, involve large scale developments such as construction of new cities or expansion of existing ones. And this can lead to destruction of natural habitats, um, deforestation and soil uh, pollution and air pollution. And which can have led, uh, which can lead to long lasting effects. And one of such effects uh, we felt when we had sudden and uh, unusual and very severe sand and dust storm in the capital city of Uzbekistan in Tashkent in November 2021. According to state uh, weather agency, Tashkent has never experienced this kind of storms. As uh, the concentration of dust in the air was 30 times higher of the normal level, and the deterioration of visibility was 100 and 200 meters. And finally, in a, there also might be the risk of bad water scarcity, which can be exacerbated by construction uh, projects. Uh, the use of water in construction and the displacement of natural water sources can have a significant impact on the environment uh, and can also lead to conflict between different sectors and stakeholders. Thank you. Um, this, this, that's very interesting. And I can tell that despite, even if we leverage from the Paris Agreement, we have to pay our efforts towards climate change and mitigation and resilience. But then also we need to respect each nation's right to development. So it's always a tricky situation to find ourselves in. And I'm really curious to find out that given the examples that you have shared, uh, the scenarios that you have painted, and the hard choices that you have made, how did you leverage your experiences and how did you navigate this decision making um, while trying to navigate this conflict or this tension? Do you want to go first for now? So I think it is one, one of the most important thing for our organization is that uh, we, uh, we stopped to blame uh, communities that are living in ecological areas for the destruction of uh, nature. And we assumed an a holistic approach of understanding some of the push and pull factors that uh, make them to uh, destroy the environment. And, and, and if you look really down on the root cause is the issue of uh, uh, just livelihood. Somebody just wants to support their family and uh and one example would be that I, I was in one meeting in one of the uh of, uh, of our outreach and the, and the community member just said final it's not like we do not understand the impact uh, that we are posing on, on mother nature but again if i go back home uh, and i'm a pineapple farmer and, and for me i have to wait until the season six months or one year to just be able to harvest and sell and to be able to make a livelihood in the meantime, what, what, what do I do as, a, as, as, as an individual? How do I support my family? So to us, it, it became very clear that it was just the issue of uh, finding sustainable ways of them to earn income uh, and livelihood and support their families. Uh, so that holistic approach of understanding and not blaming and uh, using integrated uh, methodologies of bringing all the stakeholders to, to the table and understanding what really uh, impacts, impacts them and uh, how can we now collectively uh, safeguard the, the, the interests of nature in terms of conservation, uh, the interest of development, the business aspect to that, and uh, bring all the people to the table. I think it's important to understand as well, and, and in the words of Wangari Mathai, she, she said that you cannot, you cannot protect the environment unless you empower people. You help them understand that the resources that they have there are theirs. And it's their responsibility to protect them. So in that context, uh, really, you have to 
work with the community around that because at the end of the day, if you do not do that, the impact that comes back is more far more worse. And uh, we don't benefit if nature loses and the people lose at the same time. Thanks, Fanuel. Uh, it sounds like uh, a multi-stakeholder approach towards you know, identifying all the drivers that contribute to environmental degradation help Fanuel uh, navigate this situation. And I'm still so curious to hear how, after making that hard decision to get into entrepreneurship, how you then navigated this whole thing, because I'm sure it was tough. John Murray. So the first step was to get the product in hand, which we did, even if we sacrificed the wet environment. But another trap was people were excited and then they started coming to request for the product. So we had to start producing more to sell, forgetting that we are polluting. Until the day I sat down and thought, what was the reason for me to start this? Was it to continue polluting or just to save the environment? And then I decided to sit with the team and then we decided to go green by just combining the social aspect, environmental aspect and economic aspect. Because honestly speaking, there are hard decisions to that sometimes we have to we face, let's take this scenario whereby you are a policymaker in a country and an investor is coming with a big project ready to create like 200 jobs. But looking at the environmental side, the, the project is going to cost a lot to the environment. But looking at the situation of the country, you need those jobs to be created. It's always hard to manage or to make a decision in that situation. So that was what we did. I decided to stop everything and to start a process of just changing everything, automating, redu reduce emissions, zero emissions, increase jobs, create more jobs, but also protect the environment. That's what we are about to start maybe next month with machines, and then now my heart will say, environment is good, I'm getting money, but also uh, people are getting jobs, yeah. That, that, that actually gives me a lot of hope, knowing that if you re-strategize and um, take more ideas into consideration, you can still have a win-win situation where you still make the money and still protect the environment. So that means all hope is not lost. Is that the same scenario you are seeing, Dong Pyong, with your experiences in the ship industry? Um, first of all, the marine industry have uh, there is no silver bullet to um, you know renewable energy. Because shipping industry cannot alone solve the whole problem. They wait until the solution, like innovation of technology, comes up from other sector, such as um, berries. That one is uh, from the automobile industry. But uh, now I see industry now relying on um, a fruit, um, like a very um, easy, easy level of a uh, low energy, like uh, natural energy, low hanging fruit of energy. So they, they can um, apply, they can comply with uh, regulation. They don't need to worry about uh, penalty like uh, such as, but I think we needed to do more holistic policy into energy policy. So what I, what I found, what I'm interested in doing my project is to, um, like um, in, enlarge the, the, the opportunity that R&D uh, can be applied from uh, like a private sector. You know, 
Um, so from my practical experience, I started my career in Korea Coast Guard, and I've seen a lot of government ownership are very old, like very old school. They are they needed to be renovated. They needed to be built again. But it's not only my country, South Korea. It is universal. Look at the the battleship of America, United States. When they are going to be scrapped, you you are going you are going to be surprised because they are older than you. I'm, I'm sure. And so once they once the ship is built, they will operate over forty years. This is like a twenty years longer than private private vessels. So I, I'm now trying to persuade a um, policymaker to, to build a renewable energy basis on pure engine so they can reduce emission. But I'm, I'm trying to give them information what I have. There are some cases in the United States and British, they are already employed. They employed that technology into battleship so they can um, prepare the future. So yes, that's what I found, which is very interesting. Thank you, Dong Pyong. And the question then comes, who is responsible for the policy making? It's the local leadership, right? Yeah. And how is the local leadership responsive to such situations and Nodira, you work in government and how have you seen the leadership in Uzbekistan navigating this situation? Thank you, Elias, for your question. So um, economic development and environmental protection are both important for are both important priorities for Uzbekistan. And even though there are some tensions between them, we can balance them. Uh, through careful planning, sustainable practices, and commitment to environmental stewardship. To address uh, the concerns uh, of the projects which I uh, explained uh, previously, uh, for example, in mining project in Uzbekistan, might be subject to rigorous environmental impact assessment and monitoring to ensure that it complies with environmental regulation and standards. To address the tension in construction projects, it is important to adopt sustainable construction practices and that balance economic development and environmental protection. This can include adopting green building standards, using renewable energy sources, promoting energy efficient designs, and minimizing waste and pollution. Actually, um, also, I would like to tell that I like very much the format of the seminar which we have today, because the representatives of different sectors are gathered together, like from private sector, NGO, government, and uh, environmental organizations uh, to discuss. Of course, every of the representatives can have their own interests um, and influence, but only by gathering all the stakeholders together and discussing uh, the needs of every sector and the interests and to find and find out, figure out, figuring out the solutions which can be uh, beneficial for every sector is key in this process. Uzbekistan um, has made um, um, significant uh, progress in adopting all those environment issues in policy agenda. It has implemented a bunch of policies and uh, concept and uh, programs uh, in order to balance this tension between economic development and environmental protection. For example, in 2019, we uh, uh, approved the strategy of uh, transition to green economy. And uh, we are um, intended to uh, have uh, by 2030, the 25% of using uh, renewable re energy in the economy. So it means that every of these programs and concepts they implement uh, and they have adopted all these kinds of uh, standards, uh, practices, uh, plans, etc. 
Uh, but as uh, we are now in the beginning of all the process, and uh, it seems like uh, more reminds like goal setting. I feel and I believe that it is time to move and shift from just goal setting to real action uh, to do this. And we can make a real understanding and uh, uh, results after some time, which we have, but this process should be uh, uh, very strictly monitored. And also it is important uh, to notify here that I think that the most important in this process to succeed at the end of the day is to use so-called bottom-up approach when we use the interest of local communities where those projects are realized. Um, only by using this approach, we can um, be sure that uh, we can reach those sustainability and balancing in this uh, process. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Nodira. Um, thank you. Um, from what all of you have said, it, it's really clear that whether we are talking about millennium development goals or sustainable development goals, there are so much interlinkages that you cannot spearhead one development goal. You need to also focus on the other goals. And um, we also need to have a multi-stakeholder approach that encompasses everybody. So. From what we have heard from our panel, I am going to open the floor to questions um, from the audience. Um, I guess one thing I kind of noticed hearing you know, everyone's different opinions or perspectives on stuff is that, you know, it seems like there's no, obviously, there's no clear answer. So when you're making these decisions with these people who, you know, maybe they really value what's coming in on these boats compared to the people who are looking at the damage of using those boats, you know, how do you guys go about that process of deciding, you know, when, where, where you create that line or is that kind of situation, like case to case more than, uh, Don't you get the question? Maybe I should just repeat the question for for the people who didn't get it. Um, he's asking how you manage the decision making when you have to. There are people who look at it from the damage that results from, in your case, the shipping industry, right? And then one can also look at it from the benefits that come out of the shipping industry. So. How do you navigate that? So shipping industry is uh, it is presented globally, globally working from all over the world. It's easy to make a sanction, uh, easy to manage all those regulations. So shipping industry is special that like, uh, there is a the national they regulated all the ship all over the world. So in case it's very difficult to uh, control, regulate them, but there is a, there, but, but when it comes to emission, um, the, the party agreement have a lot to regulate and uh, the make government make decision. So, and I, I see uh, there's a big change compared to 10 years ago, five years ago now, because when we implement the change of policy, we need a budget, right? But the, 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 all the like, ministry, they talk about this is important. That is very important. No one like, uh, uh, you know, um, hardly to make a final decision. But those kinds of consensus from the, from the, from the, like international organization that they, they make a uh, um like policy maker including me um, to, to make decisions 
Thank you, Carlos. Uh, it's never easy for uh, if you're working in a geo sector. Uh, the the issue of finance is always uh, a bottleneck. Uh, that's why it's important to invest in community and uh, working with uh, the local in, uh, the local communities in terms of uh, creating modules or systems that can continue even after the the funding is over. So I'll give you a specific example. Uh, in the area where we are trying to restore this ecological balance of, of the wildlife corridor, we, we, we had a project where we are supposed to uh, plant a certain number of trees. And of course, after the financing was over, uh, uh, the role of the organization had finished at that particular point. However, now the community started seeing uh, some of the, the benefits that they were, they, were, they, were, they were getting out of the project. So for example, there is the question of having indigenous trees. Uh, so, 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 so what happens is that uh, because of massive deforestation, some of the tree species that were around were disappearing. So with the project that we, we had, we were able to have like a, a community seed bank where we were able to store some of the indigenous trees, tree species. So long after the project was finished, the community still continue with the practices of collecting and bringing seeds. To their community bank and the, the hope is that they're going to plant and restore their their, their traditional uh, their, their farming areas with this seed that they have in the long term so for example one of the farmers uh came to me okay fund i understand that uh the project is over but i i have 100 acres of, of land here uh and i want to uh make sure that my son when he comes in in the long term he has the opportunity to have uh, a capital to start his business and everything. And we know that from, uh, from experience that hardwood and native species, species are more profitable. So what we did is that, okay, we worked with the farmer and uh, we tried to help him reestablish re the farm in that model of making sure that they see the value in the long term and not only after the project has finished. And that I think is, has been helpful in terms of ensuring sustainability. Oh, okay. Uh, John Marie has got a contribution sitting with you. Okay. Yeah, uh, I have something to add on the what Dompio said on your question. You can look at a tree with the fruits on it, but sometimes if you don't think about how the way or the uh, the journey for someone who planted the tree up to that level, you can only clap on the fruits without knowing the consequences or the involvement of environment issues or around the project you are seeing, the fruit. So why do I say that? To answer your question on adding on what Dompio said. When I was, I was having my product in hands, people were coming, yeah, Congratulations, you've made it. But inside myself, I was knowing I know the cost that I did to the environment side. So we have to consider the owner or the initiator of the project has to think on a way of balancing the two. Am I really true with myself on this result? They are clapping. Or I have to adjust something. So it's up to the initiator or the leader to decide. Regardless, what people are saying, you know the truth about how harmful or how not harmful something you are doing is. Okay, um, Ed has got a question for you. Um, 
Yeah, um, sorry about the technology. It looks like the microphones are either on or off. Um, my question is, um, we hear in the news of all, all these big international treaties. We just finished COP uh, in, in, in Egypt. Big international treaties, uh, all governments sending onto all these different protocols. I'm interested in seeing how these distill to organizations such as yourselves who are working on the ground. Is there any connection between the work that you're doing, Fano? Yeah, Jean-Marie, what you're doing on the ground, how does it connect to these big dialogues that are taking place at the global level? Uh, uh, I think there is, uh, so the COPs are very helpful for NGOs in terms of uh, championing uh, uh, restoration and climate issues and also biodiversity recovery. So uh, for our organization, I think, uh, since this is a decade of nature restoration for those who are of climate change, for those who are working on nature-based solution for uh, as, a, as, a, as a as a tool for uh, climate uh, mitigation uh what I, what it has helped us is that uh, the we have now the ability to restore more ecosystems so for example uh there are now in international organization and also governments that now because of the decision that comes from this international organ uh uh, conference and uh, uh, agreements, they assimilate that to the to the bottom of, of, of their planning. So, for example, uh, more specifically, at uh, the issue of diversity of tree species, where do we get the seeds to plant? So, of course, now we have destroyed the planet. We have cut down trees. Many species have gone endemic. Where do we find now indigenous trees? And indigenous, indigenous seeds to, to restore all those areas, those, those areas. So conversa conversation that are started at a global level, they help us to trickle down until the last uh, person. And uh, when we work with the community, they will let you know, okay, I spotted a, a certain tree species that is more helpful instead of us planting uh, uh, invasive or an native tree species. Now uh, we are able now to, to bring in and, and uh, have uh, financing to bank the seeds and stuff like this. So, so, so this, these international treaties are very helpful in terms of championing uh, or channeling how we want to do uh, development or restoration in a more sustainable way. My point of view is being positive and negative at the same time. In a positive way, all those agreements are between countries. They decide and then they work on policies based on their agreements. And uh, the connection between these agreements and the bottom line of business people, private sector is that the policies that I implement the country in regard to the environment protection are going to affect businesses in a way because to get a license to start your business, you have to work on a set of documents, uh, including even environment uh, uh, risk assessment. So that is the connection. But in another way, sometimes there are times they say, don't do this because it's harmful. But if you look at the context and interests and what you want to achieve, you see that I wish this policy was not in place so that I may make more money as a business person or help more people, create more jobs. So sometimes it's hard. Yeah, so just an addition on that, uh, on the negative side now, uh, for example, uh, in, in East Africa, there is the, the East African pipeline that is, there is the East African pipeline that is being constructed from Uganda and it passes via Tanzania. So the project has received a very big backlash, especially from the European community. And uh, in the defense of the Tanzanian and the, and the, and the Ugandan government uh, is that, of course, we understand the repercussion of, of the emissions and we have done due diligence to do that and that and that. However, as nations as well, since we are contributing very less in terms of emissions, uh, I think we also have to understand that we need to develop our country's economies. And, 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 and uh, if we are not, we are not going to, to be able to develop these economies, the eventuality of, of uh, 
uh, the challenges of adapting also to climate might as well not be realized. So, 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 so nations also like Tanzania are trying to be more resilient in terms of the economy uh, internally and through stakeholders, so as they are, they, they are in a position also to mitigate and adapt to the challenges that climate change is presenting. So, yeah. Any more questions? Okay. I have a question on how do you make sure that the, the people who you are working with actually understand your um, Google and what you are actually doing? For example, how do you make sure your employees also support your decisions? And um, for uh, if we are working with farmers, um, how do you make sure that they understand your approach? And how do you make sure that they know this is for the long-term benefits? And especially when, like, I feel like a lot of ordinary people don't understand the concept of climate change and uh, like the sustainability the same way as we do, because we have studied this or maybe we have learned it, like it, have a, a holistic view of it. But a lot of people may just think this might just be a concept and they don't know about the, cons uh, the consequences, of their actions, and how do you make sure that they all understand it? Okay, um, I think I will just give a, a mini contribution and then pass it to Fano. Okay. Um, so when it comes to climate change and particularly in Africa, we have seen that the effects of climate change are seen and felt in real time. It's not something that you theoretically talk about. You will find that one farmer will tell you that the last time we had a drought this severe, you were not even born. The last time we had an earthquake was a hundred years ago. The last, so they relate to the day-to-day -day happenings and it makes it easy for a professional in agriculture and rural development, environmental protection, to help them relate to what they see on a daily basis to climate change. It's not always about Telling them about climate change in terms of the emissions, you know, the techie language, the fancy stuff. But, you know, if you reduce it, if you dumb it down in a way that my grandmother can understand it. So it always comes back to the way you communicate with your community, the language that you use. If you go with a PowerPoint presentation that has got equations and formulas, obviously they won't get it. But then if you relate it to what they see in their fields, in their rivers, and their daily uh, happenings in real time, it helps a lot. I think Edith uh, put it very well. You might be surprised that the people that understand the impact of climate are the ones that are, uh, especially in rural areas, because uh, over the years, they have been able to observe and uh, you, so, so unlike other places in, in Tanzania specifically, we rely much mostly on uh, local knowledge to predict weather. So somebody will tell you like, uh, hey, the way the clouds are aligning today, it's going to be raining in the few hours. And you can dispute that, but it will happen because they have the local knowledge. So uh, if you are a development practitioner, and you come, like Edith, with your knowledge and your PhD and your doctorate, it might not work instantly. So you have, uh, you have to assume the listening, uh, empathic listening, like really trying to understand and respect the opinion. And, and most of the time, they will, they will be able to give you. And the respect of local, local knowledge uh, will give you so much to work with whenever you are trying to implement a solution that is within that particular area. Um, thank you very much for such an important and interesting question. So um, actually, in case of um, research or think tank institutions, um, we are trying to involve those farmers and local community people to our research and our study. Of course, uh, we cannot do the decision um, sitting in capital city about the people who are thousand kilometers from the city. Uh, without studying concretely uh, what kind of uh, challenges uh, those farmers are meeting. So that's why in this 
case, the research institutions, they can be some, some, somehow linking institution between those smallholder farmers or farmers and policy decision makers. And it is very important to do those surveys, uh, to do the study uh, and to take uh, and to make the decisions uh, according to concrete needs of the concrete people, uh, concrete communities. Of course, uh, it is crucial in this, in all the, the process which we are discussing today, it's very important to ensure that any development project uh, are carried out in a way that minimizes the environmental impact and public health risks. This can involve implementing and enforcing strict regulations and standards. But at the same time, these regulations should not be too strict. Um, and here it's very important to find the balance as well. What is the level of intervention of the government to this? Because we still need to, our business to develop and make a profit. And at the same time, to have our environment uh, protected. So um, that's why I think that it's very important to involve uh, those local uh, community people to research and to policy decision making. Thank you. Okay, uh, so it sounds like uh, there is no right or wrong, or there is wrong and wrong. <laughs> But from what I'm, I'm hearing here, it's really important to investigate further and understand the drivers of each initiative, whether the initiative is towards economic efficiency or it's towards environmental protection. Because at the end of the day, we want a better planet. We want a better earth. Uh, we don't want other people to be hungry while protecting the environment. At the same time, we don't want to compromise the environment while people are well fed. So we need to keep working on having that balance. And we need to engage each other, whether it's governments, whether it's the entrepreneurs, the NGOs, everybody has got a seat at the table and everybody can contribute in their own way to have a win-win situation. Um, thank you guys for such insight. Um,